Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. Please find your seats. I know folks are still coming in. There's plenty of room. We're going to get started. I just have a couple announcements real quick. Hello. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. Great, so thank you all for being here today and um, it's really been a wonderful conference and I appreciate each and every one of you being here to make it a special year. Um, please remember next year we already have the dates set and we will be having the EcoFarm Conference January 21st through 24th, Jan 2015. <laughs> so um, today I just want to make a couple quick notes. Um, MP3 sales are available after the conference through the EcoFarm website. Um, for those of you staying at Asylum, our checkout time is 11 a.m. unless you called, so take care of that if you didn't. <laughs> and um, closing circle today at the beach at 1.15, um, and we're also doing a rain dance, so please bring your songs about water and instruments and anything. Pardon? And your raincoats. Good idea. <laughs> we'll make it pour. So, um, it is my absolute pleasure to introduce my friend and the board president, Ms. Lisa Bunin. <laughs> so Dr. Lisa Bunin is um, the EFA board president. She is the organic policy director at the Center for Food Safety. She's on our planning committee. She does so much for the organization and she is my favorite artistic comrade. We uh, had a photo show together and um, it's really been a fun, fun thing having a dialogue with Lisa. So. Welcome, Lisa, to the stage. Hey, Liz. Hey, Lisa. Hey, did you know that Maria Rodale's speaking at the plenary today? Yeah. Didn't she write that book, The Organic Manifesto, a rallying cry about the need to eat organic food because it's good for health, the environment, and the planet? Yeah, and as a third generation Rodale, it's not surprising to me that she wrote an organic manifesto. Just look at her family history. The Rodales have been promoting the idea that good health comes from eating food grown in healthy soils for decades. I think organic advocacy is encoded in her DNA. <laughs> That's really funny. <laughs> yup, her grandfather, J.I. Rodale, founded Organic Farming and Gardening magazine in 1942. He used his magazine as a forum to challenge post-World War II pesticide company claims about the benefits of converting wartime chemicals to peacetime use in agriculture. The magazine is still being published today, over 70 years later. Wow. And did you know that they still sell thir three million magazines worldwide? Wow, that's awesome. Have you ever heard of the term organiculture? Mm -mm. <laughs> J.I. coined it way back in 1948 to explain the growing movement that he believed was destined to alter our conceptions of the farm and the garden and to revolutionize our methods of operating them in order to secure a more, a more abundant food source for all of us. Yeah, that's true. You know, he didn't see organic as a, fair, as a fad. He saw it as a lifestyle, a healthful lifestyle that it would increasingly gain popularity as many people understood the absurdity of spreading toxic chemicals on our land to, to grow food, especially those used to fight war. Yeah, Maria's father Robert followed in J.I.'s footsteps. He wanted to prove the superiority of organic agriculture over conventional. That's why in 1981, he started the farming systems trial at the Rodale Institute. And what a great project that is, I love it. And I love the fact that that after 30 years of conducting side-by-side -side field trials of organic and conventional agriculture, the research unquestionably shows that organic years, yields are comparable or even better than conventional. They also show <laughs> that organic farming is more efficient than conventional. It uses 45% less energy and <laughs> conventional ag produces 40% more greenhouse gases. Whoa. Not a real good climate. No. Wow. Well, what I like most about their research is that it demonstrates that organic systems of food production have no problem feeding the world in a manner that supports thriving people, communities, <laughs> and ecosystems. I'm sure we'll learn a lot more about their other research findings from Maria. 
Now I want to change the subject, but <laughs> did you know that Rodale Inc. is one of the America's leading independent book publishers of health and lifestyle magazines like Women's Health and Runner's World? And Prevention Magazine, first published in 1950, before both of us were born. <laughs> it's still being published today. True to its original mission, it teaches readers how to prevent disease rather than treat the symptoms of disease after they arise. That sounds like the right philosophy of how we should treat the land. And how about the incredible diversity of books they publish, like The South Beach Diet, Al Gore's In Inconvenient Truth, The Organic Suburbanite, The Testosterone Advantage, A Roadmap to Ecstasy. Yeah, I like that one. That sounds like my kind of book. <laughs> It just so happens that I have my 1973 copy <laughs> of, of J.I. Rodale's Complete Compost book right here. <laughs> a friend gave me her well-loved copy when I was off to do my PhD research at UC Santa Cruz when I was researching organic cotton production systems. It's good stuff. <laughs> and I've often heard people affectionately refer to it as the compost bible. And somebody stopped me right while I was walking down the, the path and said, hey, yeah, I love that book. It's really fabulous. And I'm not sure that another book has ever really come close to this, having this much comprehension of information. Um, it's over 1,000 pages, and it has 27 chapters. Really? Wow. And isn't it fascinating to look back at the Rodales as pioneers of the organic movement? Yeah. Robert Rodale won the Susty here at Eco Farm in 1990 the same year the Asilomar Declaration was written. Yeah, and it's encouraging to see that their legacy and mission continues today, steeped in decades of organic advocacy. Did you know that Rodale's Institute's current motto, healthy soil equals healthy food equals healthy, healthy people, was first written on a blackboard by J.R. Rodale all the way back in 1947, again, way before we were born. That is so cool. <laughs> Well, getting back to Marie and her book, I really want to share with you one of my favorite quotes. You know, I have one too, if you do just one thing. Make one conscious choice that can change the world? Go, Go organic. organic. <laughs> Welcome, Marie Rodale. Well, they just gave my whole speech for me, so <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Um, I figured you guys, um, well, first of all, thank you for having me, and, and I'm really happy to be here, um, that, you know, you already kind of drunk in the organic Kool-Aid, and um, I don't need to go into, you know, defending organic that much. Uh, what I really want to talk about is how do we get from here to there, and what is there, and where do we want to go? Um, and you know, I will talk a little bit about the history of how we've gotten here and what we've learned that I think can help us get there. So here's the remote. So um, for me, and I think for J.I. and for my father, um, you know, it was really about healing. You know, healing the earth um, and healing the human body. Um, and um, we're really only just tapping into that potential with organic to be a resource for healing. Uh, and I believe that it's, it's got to go beyond just the land, but um, also to the human heart. And, um, and I don't mean that in like, you know, the ventricular way. Um, so I'll talk about that also. Um, but, you know, we know that healing the earth is possible. This is the picture, a picture of the farm that my grandfather and my grandmother bought in 1940, um, where they decided they were going to test this organic method and see if they could rehabilitate, you know, a, a broken down um, farm. Um, I'm going to read something to you in a minute of describing that process, but you know, I do want to show you before before I go there that you know this is that farm today. So it's beautiful. This is the farm I grew up on. Um, it was a self-sufficient organic farm when my grandfather was alive, and it's still, you know, very actively um, producing today. 
um, and it's the kind of the, it's the heart of the Rodale family. This isn't actually the working um, the Rodale Institute farm. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about that later. Um, in the 60s, we had so many people coming to visit us on our home farm that we bought another farm um, and did a similar sort of healing process. So um, this is my grandparents. Uh, they were not hippies. They, um, <laughs> they were um, maybe a little bohemian, but you know, really, they were living the American dream. They, uh, you know, my grandfather was a Lower East Side tenement Jew um, who, you know, worked for the IRS and then with his brother started electrical engineering business. And um, he had health problems of his own. So as they were making a lot of money during uh, World War II with their electrical engineering business, he's like, he started to research how he could improve his health. Um, and I think, you know, at this point, maybe six of his brothers and sisters had already died young of heart disease. So that's how he discovered Sir Albert Howard and Lady Eve Balfour. And, and you know, he really became obsessed with this idea that how you grow food really impacts your health. And he was determined to um, improve his own health. You know, my grandmother actually, she was um, orphaned, uh, you know, coal miner's daughter from Tamaqua, Pennsylvania. And that's how they ended up in Pennsylvania. Um, so I want to read a story. You know, he, he got into publishing as a hobby, but also to publish his own books, because nobody else would publish his own books. Um, <laughs> so he was one of the original self-publishers. Um, but I want to read a story about their experience with, with the farm that they bought. Um, it's two pages, so bear with me. It was a tenant farm. And there was the, unusual, uh, the usual friction between tenant and owner, so that between the two, the land went down horribly. The nutritional quality of the crops evidently was so mediocre that it could not satisfactorily nourish the chickens, which were the poorest lot I had ever seen. When we came onto the place, there were at least a dozen dead ones that had been thrown under the corn crib for all the world to see. The cows looked scrubby, but the rats, poor creatures, had to take the hardest bumps. They looked terribly starved and emaciated. At night, when we would go into the barn and, putting on the lights, surprise them, they would run nervously. They were skinny rats with bones protruding precariously through mangy skins. I was not experienced with rats in those days, but any untaught amateur in the lore of rodentry could see that these specimens were the worst of their scummy race. <laughs> they seemed terribly dissatisfied at something, no doubt at being poorly fed, and if they could have gotten at the farmer, they would have shown him a thing or two. They seemed savagely displeased and snarled as they ran. They were probably better off dead, but unfortunately, rats don't die as easily as chickens. <laughs> now the curtain goes down for about three years in which we assiduously practice the organic method, putting goodly amounts of organic matter into our so soil with loving hands and treating the good earth with reverence and with a conscience. Although it was a hand-to-hand -hand war with weeds, disease, hard, crusty soil, and the writing of all the previous farmers' malpractices, the cash spent was less than if we had tried to do it by the chemical method. In those days, we made compost, and that was a chore, but we were paid for it in cash by not having to purchase fertilizers. Today, the rebuilding job would be pie, and we could do it with our hands tied behind our back, for there's no longer any compost making in farming with the organic method. The same materials that we so carefully piled in heaps years ago today go directly on the land with a minimum of labor and with a great, greater conservation of its nutrients. The land became healed and the regeneration showed itself in the fruitfulness of the crops. There was a tremendous improvement in their appearance when compared with those of the previous farmer. This was especially true with the corn, which in the case of the predecessors were small, gnarled, and diseased, while ours were big, golden ones when fed to the farm animals, which made them healthy. What was my surprise one night when I put on the lights in the barn to see nice, sleek, well-nourished looking rats, <laughs> which looked at me and blinked their eyes as if to say, hello, what can we do for you? Not realizing what had happened, I picked up the first object I could lay my hands on, a small piece of wood, and threw it at one of them. I can still see that rat today. He seemed to look at me in mild amusement and slowly dodged as the missile, miss, missile came towards him. His mind evidently was able to coordinate his actions in split-second response 
because he was able to dodge just enough to miss the piece of wood by a 30 second, second of an inch. The rest of the rats began to slowly waddle away, <laughs> evidently amused by the irregular conduct they had just witnessed. They were amiable creatures that reminded me of opossums. <laughs> One last paragraph, and I know this is long, but it's like I want to show that like, the roots of all this revolution are really here from the beginning. I did not realize it at the time, but as I lay in my bed that night, it hit me with the impact of a sledgehammer blow. Those rats were being fed an organically produced diet without the harmful effects of chemical fertilizers. No matter how careful you are on a farm, the rats will get at the crop somehow, and handling it, some stray grains will fall on the floor in the barn, and there's always an open sack beckoning to the rats to come in and get it. Slowly, over the years, those rats were eating a better produced diet than the people in the neighboring city of Allentown. And come to think of it, the rats that I had met that night were perhaps of the 10th generation organically fed. Their great-grandparents, back to God knows what degree of great greatness, had already been the recipients of this highly vitamin vitaminized and mineralized diet. So, anyway. <laughs> So from the, from the beginning with my grandfather, it was all about health. Um, he was not by nature a farmer. In fact, I never saw him in anything other than a suit. Um, and then the 60s happened. Um, and at you know, the peak of his popularity, and um, uh, you know, he, he died of a heart attack um, on the Dick Cavett Show. Some of you may know that story. Um, um, I know his last regret was that he did not live long enough to go on the Johnny Carson show, which he was scheduled for you know, uh, later that week. But um, he, you know, he got this whole thing started. And you know, it's so wonderful to see a new regeneration of passion and interest today among young farmers. Um, and it's as if they're re you know, rediscovering it themselves, and that's wonderful. But it's also important to remember how um, this, this happen because we have to learn the lessons that'll happen again. Um, so with this, you know, great media that they got, the big, you know, the, all of a sudden the medical scientific uh, establishment started saying, you know, well, yeah, but there's no proof that organic is better, you know, and it's not possible to feed the world and, um, you know, you can't go backwards, you have to go forwards. So along comes my dad and, um, He's like, I'm going to prove it. So for multiple reasons, including the fact that, you know, people in Volkswagen buses were showing up at, you know, our house every night for dinner that we didn't know. Um, <laughs> we bought a farm about 20 minutes away, and this is the home of the Rodale Institute. It was also, this is a before image. This is when we bought it in 1973. It was degraded by seven generations of uh, you know, poor farming and just kind of um, you know, traditional, conventional farming. Um, I, I'm, I mean, I remember playing on this farm and literally, I don't know if you can see you know, where the stream was, but I mean, it was just, it was, you know, it was mud and dirt and caked, you know, it was not alive. This farm was dead. Um, this is the farm today, and it's also where, you know, the home of the farming systems trial, where um, for over 30 years we've been bringing scientists from around the world. The USDA has been involved and supported it. Uh, we've been studying side by side organic versus chemical conventional agriculture. And even now for the last four years we've added a GMO um, contingent, which we're still not, still don't have uh, results on other than that. Uh, well, I have some data on it. But um, what's been interesting to me to watch over the last 30 years is, you know, we've got tons of evidence now <laughs> um, that organic is better. Tons. Um, so this is, as um, Liz went, went, went through, I mean, this, is, this research is out there. It's been validated and double validated by USDA scientists, by multiple scientists. Organic farming uses less energy. Um, it produces much less greenhouse gases. Um, it's more profitable. Yields are even and actually more during um, times of drought and flood. Um, 
and organic systems build rather than deplete the soil matter, making it, you know, a sustainable system. I mean, and I'm sure you, you know, you know this. The soil in an organic system is alive. It's, um, it's, you know, it's playing a role that is uh, just so important. And even, I mean, that to me, that's where the the future of the research is. Is what exactly are all these billions of creatures doing in a handful of soil? Um, and actually, the research in the medical establishment that's happening is showing that we have a lot of the same bacteria in our guts, and that's what keeps us healthy. So um, it's kind of exciting because even though we've been at this for 30 years, things have changed, um, and we're learning more and more. And um, you know, 30 years ago, global warming, climate change was not on anybody's radar, and now we know that organic farming um, can really prevent climate change. And this is, again, validated by UN studies. Um, it's the way to go. Um, and there's tons of other data. Um, you know, erosion. Um, you know, the myth of genetically modified um, profits in production. Um, you know, the fact that, you know, now Roundup is not enough to kill these super weeds, but it's 2,4-D and um, Agent, Agent Orange and, you know, more and more atrazine. I mean, we know these things are bad. We know they're bad. Um, and we know that genetically modified crops are, you know, exploding the use of these things. Um, you know, and on the other hand, we've made a lot of progress. Organic foods um, have grown from 1 billion in 1990 when my father passed away um, to 26 billion in 2010. It's, it's actually one of the few areas of growth during the, the Great Recession um, of the past few years. And, um, you, know, I, you know, when my father died in 1990, there was no USDA organic label. It had really only just, um, just uh, started kind of um, forming. So, um, you know, back in my grandfather's day, if you wanted to eat organic, you had to grow it yourself. So, um, some other data points. Wait. On the farm. Um, you know, a lot of organic farmers are significantly more profitable than non-organic farmers. Um, so, it's a, it's a thing, you know, that farmers should want to be organic. Um, so, if we have all this evidence, here's the moment where it's like, okay, we've got all this evidence. Like, why does change take so long? Why is it so hard? Why is it just so frustrating, you know, to get people to embrace, um, you know, embrace what's right and what's healthy and what's good? And how can we as concerned defenders and protectors of nature make it happen faster? Um, you know, this is especially something that I've been thinking a lot about during, you know, watching um, the GMO right, you know, right to know efforts and it's like, ugh, this is, you know, you get so close and it's like, it's such a fight, um, but how can we transcend all this? How can we um, transform this debate? Uh, and I, I've come to the conclusion that it's not logical, it's emotional. <laughs> Because if it was logical, you know, we'd already be changing. I mean, we wouldn't have climate change. Um, it's also about money, but the money is emotional too. Um, in fact, in the New York Times today, there was an article about how Coke and Nike are finally like planning for and adapting for climate change. Not because they philosophically believe in it, but because it's you know, finally affecting their bottom line. Um, so, why do I say it's emotional? Um, when I did my research for Organic Manifesto, um, I came across so many interesting things. This was a Dow Chemical brochure from the 1950s. Um, uh, and, you know, I, you'd, you'd be amazed at this brochure. It was like, you know, man's fight against nature, you know, kill the soil, you know, in order to, you know, literally it was like, war, it, you know, pictures of army guys, far, you know, on their tractors, you know, out to kill nature so that they could like, you know, rip the production out of the soil. Um, 
I think this is, you know, probably one of my neighbors in Kutztown, Pennsylvania, because <laughs> his name is Burkholder, and we have a lot of Burkholders. Um, <laughs> But if, in case you can't read it, it says, Burkholder stands atop and surveys mounds of farm chemicals he uses in the course of an average year. Um, so what the chemical industry really was able to do was tap into that like masculine desire for superiority over nature and control. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, and even like if you know if you look at some of the chemical names today, these, this is all in my book, Organic Manifesto. It's, it's almost funny you know, what some of these chemicals are named. Um, but, you know, when I did write Organic Manifesto, I didn't want it to just be like, you know, an insider's dietary. I really wanted to understand who, who are these chemical farmers and what, what issues do they really face and why do they deal with all these, har you know, terrible chemicals, even though, and, you know, I know some part of them must know in their, you know, that it's wrong. Um, and I was really shocked. I did, I did focus groups. So, you know, I'm a business person by day. And, um, you know, so I, I took a business tool and I did focus groups with farmers. They didn't know who I was or um, where I was coming from. And, and actually farmers, these farmers are so focus grouped out by the chemical companies that you have to bring food. You have to promise them, you have to pay them a lot more money than you pay normal people and you have to bring food to get them to show up because the chemical companies are constantly doing focus groups with these, with these men. They're all men. Um, there was one woman in all the focus groups, even though I asked for women to be represented, and um, uh, she was just there because her husband couldn't make it. Um, but, you know, first of all, these guys are really trapped in the treadmill. They are told they have to feed the world. They need more land. They need to produce more to feed the world. Um, and so they get more acres, and, you know, and then they get trapped in this, you know, debt. And, you know, the cost of giant equipment, and they can't get out of it. And they still believe in their heart and hearts that they're um, going to save the world. But at the root, it's really about um, control, order, and even vanity. The fact that, um, you know, a weedy field to, you know, an Iowa farmer is kind of like, you know, showing up to church in, like, you know, your pajamas. It's just... It's not okay. <laughs> it's not okay. Um, and I noticed that when I drove up to Sacramento earlier this week. You know, the, you know, thousands, you're in the biggest drought ever, you know, that I, and like there's thousands of acres of fields that are just bare. You know, they're not, they're clean. <laughs> there's no mulch, there's no weeds, there's no cover crops. There's, you know, there's not even any black plastic. It's just, you know, bare naked earth, which is, for an organic farmer, you know, like not the thing you want to do. Um, it's like walking around without skin on. Um, so, you know, I feel, I feel compassion for these guys because I really think that they believe they're doing the right thing, but they're surrounded by people who are validating the belief that, um, that they're on the right path and that if they just grow a little more get a few more acres, it'll all work out. And part of what I found that they're surrounded by is their chemical dealer. You know, I'd, we'd ask, where do you get your information? Well, my chemical dealer, you know. Um, and their co-ops and ag stores. So, um, so we've got this issue. And then you've got us, this group of kind of well-meaning ragtag people who, um, you know, get made fun of a lot. And, you know, that's something else I've studied throughout this history because, you know, my grandfather, my father, even myself have been, you know, really um, ridiculed for our beliefs. And, um, and I've, so I've come to this um, understanding <laughs> is that ridicule is kind of required. What ridicule is is like a flock of birds going like, oh my God, there's a predator coming. <laughs> There's a dangerous new idea that's just entered the room. And, you know, you look back through history, I mean, all the great scientists, you know, were ridiculed. You know, some of them were killed, you know, and, and imprisoned. So, um, you know, it's, what, you know, so now when I, you know, when I hear it, like, there's a Twitter storm about something, you know, I've said or done, it's like, okay, you know, this is normal. It's okay. And for all of us, I think we've had to work through that ridicule. And um, it's important to, like, um, not let it get you down, because it can get you down. Um, and 
uh, you know, that's what leadership is, is like doing the things that nobody else is doing um, and being the first to do it and doing the things that are right. And, you know, I know that there's a lot of leaders in this room, so, which I'm very grateful for. Um, so a lot of this thinking for me came from studying change and how change happens. And I, you know, I'm a big women's history studier. And, you know, this is a common story that you see with change where, you know, the people who um, start the movement um, actually die before the movement reaches um, f fruition and maturity. So, you know, Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony, you know, were dead before they, you know, we got the right to vote. I don't have a picture up here of Victoria Woodhull, but she was actually just as involved and, you know, written out of a lot of history books because she was, a, you know, little, um, she believed in free love, which is the right for a woman to marry for love and get divorced if she's abused. Um, so she was ostracized and ridiculed for those beliefs. Um, and, you know, I was really happy, both heartened and disheartened in the women in ag round table, uh, round table or whatever we called it yesterday because, you know, we're still not done. Um, you know, I think women have made so much progress, but we're still not done. And, um, you know, I think that that's important in both organic and women and everything to, to realize, okay, we're all part of this um, chain of change that has to happen. So, you know, in, in our case, you know, 1940s, the organic movement begins. You know, that's my grandfather in, you know, as casual an outfit as I've ever seen him. Um, <laughs> and now, you know, 2013, you know, Whole Foods is, $12.9 billion in revenue. This is a good thing. Like, we're winning. We are winning. I mean, one of the reasons I wrote Organic Manifesto was because I was so frustrated with hearing the organic community and people, you know, fighting over whether Whole Foods was good enough or, you know, whether local food was better than organic. And, I, you know, we all need to work together because this is a change that has to happen everywhere, in industrial farms, in small farms, in, you know, huge businesses, you know. I always say, I'll know we've won when there's an organic Coke, <laughs> which I will drink. <laughs> I'm not a soda drinker, but every once in a while you need a Coke, you know, it's medicinal. Um, <laughs> so when there's like the green Coke bottle, uh, you know, we'll know we've really, we'll, we've really won. Um, so it's important for us to, not, you know, not, not fight amongst ourselves, but to really um, uh, focus that energy outward and spread and share, you know, what we know is an awesome way of, of approaching um, the universe. Um, and again, it goes back to my thinking about this whole GMO thing and why is it so hard. And um, I came across this um, Carl Jung quote, what, what you resist persists. Um, and so if we're constantly fighting, you know, think of, a, think of a farmer. He's resisting weeds. So he gets all this stuff and he like kills it and they come back even bigger, <laughs> you know. We have to be careful we're not doing the same thing. Um, and that we're looking at, you know, I love uh, the guy, Rich, who I was on a panel with yesterday, who talked about weeds are not the problem, they're a symptom. Um, you know, we have to really look at understanding nature and working with it and understanding people and working with it and stop fighting and start collaborating. Um, and I also loved what Temple Grandin said, is that it's not really about size, you know, we, we often come at it as like industrial is bad, um, you know, it's about management, not size. Um, you know, there's good management and there's bad management and, you know, that can happen anywhere. And what we need to do is work on good management everywhere uh, because, um, you know, we can't just keep it, for the sake of all of our futures, we can't just keep this um, a niche, um, a niche anymore. We have to expand and make it the mass thing. Even though we like being niche, you know, we like being different. 
Um, I always like what um, George Seaman says. He's the founder of Organic Valley, which is now a $900 million company. Um, you know, pioneers don't like settlers. <laughs> you know, and it's true. <laughs> but, you know, why be a pioneer if, you know, if you don't want to make a better world for the settlers? Um, my, my personal um, sort of symbol for this idea is the dandelion, which I actually love. Um, you know, and if you look at lawn chemicals, they kill, um, they call, you know, it's the only one of the few chemicals that actually is, you know, scientifically proven without a doubt to cause childhood leukemia. And yet, people sp spray it because it's like, it's this like thing, this yellow thing in my green, perfect green lawn. But actually, like the dandelion is one of the most amazing plants. I mean, you can eat the leaves. It's you know, a diuretic, it's very healing. Um, uh, you know, almost every part of it has a purpose and um, is useful. So, you know, here we're trying to kill something that is actually trying to help us. So now I want to talk a little bit about my dad. This is my dad. <laughs> Part of the reason why I wanted to come here and talk was because he came here in 1990 and um, uh, it, it was one of the last conferences he went to before he died. But um, I have this picture here is because he, I don't know if anybody, if you guys know this, but he was a, an Olympic skeet shooter. Um, and it was this guy with the gun, you know, and I, I was raised in gun clubs, by the way. Um, <laughs> who sat down with the Republican politicians in Washington and the chemical lobbyists in Washington and said, you know, can we work out a deal here? <laughs> can we just like, you know, and that's where the whole sustainable funding, you know, the, it was called the LISA program. It was the first organic funding at, with the USDA. You know, it came from that kind of sitting down and collaborating. Um, with what was, you know, the enemy. Um, so, um, I mean, he didn't like the word sustainable. In fact, he hated it uh, because his thing was like, why would we want to leave things the same? We want to make it better. We know organic can make things better. So why don't, you know, we strive for better? His word that he used was regenerative, um, which, as you know, my grandfather also used. Um, so this same guy with the gun was also the guy who, you know, came here and hung out with you guys. <laughs> I think I recognize the guy in the picture. It's, it's, it's you, right? The guy with the funny hat. Okay. <laughs> um, but, you know, as, as he... I mean, he died when he was 60, but, you know, the last few years of his life, he really was starting to talk about regener re regeneration and regenerative agriculture <clears throat> as a spiritual concept. And, um, and I think that's, you know, there's really uh, um, some truth to that. And that it may, is, you know, maybe the next frontier. Um, you know, and the lesson, you know, I, I really got from him is that, you know, we really have to be willing to negotiate and collaborate and, like, reach out and understand our differences and work together. And, you know, as I was preparing for this and, and reading, reading over this last night, I thought, you know, gosh, what if there was, like, what's the Whole Foods version of the co-op for farmers? You know, there isn't, that's, you know, there isn't that right now. The chain, you know, like, the chain store that supplies organic farmers across the country, and not just with products, but with assurance and information and consulting. I mean, there, there's a business opportunity that somebody can have for free, because um, I'm not going to do it. Uh, but the, you know, the goal is how can we make this easy and validating for people? How can we shift it from being, you know, a conflict to a, you know, come on, come on, it's better over here. <laughs> it's better over here and your kids will be healthier and you'll be healthier 
and like your food is going to taste a lot better. Um, and you know, for me, it's you know we talk about saving, you know, saving the planet. You know, I I love this picture. I just uh, was in the woods in Pennsylvania uh, about a month ago, and I, I saw this. Um, it's a bed, an old metal bed that's being kind of devoured by a tree. Um, but, you know, it illustrates my point that, like, nature is going to be fine without us. You know, it's us that we have to worry about. So how do we work with nature um, to really protect and save all of us? Um, and she like really does make it easy. I mean, you don't need all those chemicals that Mr. Burkholder was standing on. In fact, she doesn't like those chemicals. Um, she likes it when you feed her, uh, you know, compost. And when you take good care of her, and when you appreciate her, and, and you know, t take the time to listen. <laughs> and look at those weeds as the symptom and not the problem. You know, what is that weed trying to tell me? Um, and you know, kind of sounds like a good relationship, actually. So, um, you know, where I'm at right now with all of this is I think we have to heal the human heart before we can heal the planet. And, um, you know, people do want to do the right thing, but it's just also confusing and complicated. And it's the heart that's afraid of change. It's, you know, the heart that, like, you know, wants to belong <laughs> and wants to fit in and doesn't want to be different. Um, so if you think about, okay, how can we heal the human heart? You know, you do that through education, um, teaching, friendliness, sharing, you know, demystifying, um, you know, therapy. <laughs> um, and I'd like to thank California for really leading this. <laughs> California has been a real leader in the whole personal transformation movement and, um, you know, California has been a co-creator in this whole, you know, organic movement. I mean, we wouldn't be as far as we are without, you know, the kind of the pioneering spirits of, of Californians. And so how can we bring some of that personal transformation to the whole movement? And for me, it comes down to, to love. Like, we protect what we love. And... Um, these are my kids. Um, what I love about this picture is it's actually at a place in Delaware called Winterthur, which is this giant mansion with an incredible playground that's completely funded by the Dow Chemical family money. <laughs> Even the people at Dow Chemicals love their kids. They do. <laughs> or they wouldn't have built this really nice playground. Um, and my kids are pretending to be birds eating worms. Um, that's why they're making that face. <laughs> so, you know, we have to kind of unite about what is the thing that we all share. And how can we kind of work together on the things that we know are important to us. And I think, you know, the, the rise in all these childhood diseases and, you know, whether it's obesity, diabetes, cancers, autism, asthma, allergies. I mean, there's so much data out there that, you know, there's a whole group of people who are, who are working on this kind of in parallel to what the organic movement is working on. And we all need to kind of join hands and work together and work together as, like, partners um, who um, respect each other, even though we're different. Um, even though not everyone is a vegetarian, and, you know, be, um, be unafraid. And, you know, I think that's kind of where I'm going to, you know, end this, is, you know, I, I believe we need more love, less fear. Organic is safer. We know that. And people will pay more for safety. We shouldn't be afraid to, say, to make those claims, to make those promises. But we have to keep it simple. We have to trust, you know, trust that the USDA seal, even though it's not perfect, is the best we have. And for a consumer, it's the only thing they might have. And, you know, we have to make it easy for everyone to understand. 
The other thing is, you know, um, thinking about, you know, when you think about your farm or your family or the world, like how can we leave it better? Um, and that's to me what the essence of organic is about, is leaving it better. And um, it's how I'm going to measure my success and how I think we have the opportunity to leave this world better than we found it um, if we work together. So thank you very much. <laughs>
drive horse and buggies and, you know, but they're actually chemical farmers. And there was one couple on the one side that uh, had a dairy farm and um, about four years ago, they were basically going to go out of business and have to sell their farm. And, you know, this is like the, the sweetest, loveliest couple you've ever seen, but they didn't know what to do. Um, and they were getting pressure from their community, which is very strong, like, no, don't go organic, you know, it's, it's not going to work. Um, in fact, the, one, the funny story was the cows won't know what to do when you open up the barn door. They're not even going to want to go outside. And <laughs> so we, we called Organic Valley, and they um, basically, we're letting them um, graze on some of our land, and um, we're working on a, a, a research project with Organic Valley. And first of all, when the barn door opened, those cows were like, yeehaw! <laughs> <laughs> they are really happy cows, and um, and these you know these Mennonite neighbors are now um, you know they're finally successful. And in fact, uh, I was talking to Jeff Moyer, who some of you may know. Um, I was asking him how they were doing, and and um, he said you know for the first time they were actually able to like start paying off their farm that they had um, bought from from their parents. So. Um, you know, it, it, it works, and sometimes, like, the farm bill is too complicated for people, but there's companies out there, you know, that are looking to help. There's organi tons of organizations that are willing to help, so. So we talk a lot about family farms, mm -hmm. but your family is an enormously influential family. So I just wanted to congratulate you and your family for Thank all the you. work you've done, <laughs> for all the years you've done it. Thank you. So you're, uh, you, you guys are as much a part of this as all of us out here in the field. So the question I have for you is relative to this GMO study that you're doing, and it's two parts. The first one is where are you getting your seeds, because my understanding is our friends in Monsanto, Bayer, Pioneer, Syngenta aren't terribly happy with sharing your seeds with institutes like yourself? And then the second is, uh, what are you looking for? What are your hypotheses over and beyond the list that you had before? Um, okay, so somebody asked that question yesterday and I was gonna email Jeff Warren and like, how do we get our seeds? I don't know how we get our seeds, but I know we get them. And I, I don't know if we, I don't, I'm almost positive we're not like an approved you know, Monsanto research site. Um, <laughs> but, um, but we are getting them, as is the farmer next door to us and the farmer on the other side. Um, what we're looking for, we're looking at, um, you know, the obvious, which is productivity, and productivity is up. Uh, but then we look at what's happening in the soil, we look at the weeds, we look at the amount of chemicals, we measure the water runoff. Um, you know, one of the things that uh, we found over and over is that chemicals applied to the soil just kind of go right through. You know, they go right into the water. They don't, they're not utilized by the plant. Um, so, um, unfortunately, we don't have the money or the expertise to study the health impacts. That's one of my long-term goals. Um, but we're going to be looking at all those things. And we, ha we have about four years' worth of data. And we're looking for a new head of research. So if anybody knows anybody, it needs to be a PhD scientist. Um, you know, let me know. So thanks. Along those lines, um, you mentioned, you know, consult, get cons cons making consulting available, or there ought to be consulting available for organic farmers across the country. So I'm thinking in terms of creating a knowledge base where, where you guys could be leaders and centers, you know, sort of a center of, of attraction. Mm -hmm. for that, to build a knowledge base that actually is based on ecoregions, which are patterns of ecosystems, and which were mapped out by World Wildlife Fund and National Geographic funding around 2001 for the planet. And as I like to talk to you about, possibilities for developing where something that everybody can feed in the information they have about their place, this fine granularity, but also you're looking at the larger patterns and bringing communities of science to work with communities on the ground is the way I thought about it for the uh, International Geographic Information Systems Conference I went to. 
Yeah, I mean, that's a great idea. And I, actually, you know, the Institute, we've talked about doing something just like that. I mean, like all nonprofits, you know, resources are stretched thin and, um, you know, we, we want to work with other groups, but um, it's a great idea, so thank you. Okay, so I might be able to help fund that with when the battery company gets going, so let me talk to you about that. <laughs> okay, <laughs> thanks. I, I'm a huge believer in the power of compassion, and I do believe that loving kindness will prevail. But I was wondering if you thought there may need to be some form of social, political, or economic collapse for there to be a paradigm shift. Uh, well, you know, what I thought was interesting about the collapse we've just been through, <laughs> which, you know, for, you know, was the biggest collapse a lot of us have ever seen, is, you know, it showed that actually, you know, a lot of the environmental movement has been, if we just reduce consumption, everything will be solved. But if we just reduce consumption, then the economy kind of like, you know, people lose jobs. <laughs> so, there, um, so I, I think if we, you know, it's like prevention. It's like prevention. I mean, you can like wait till you get sick, or wait till there is a crisis, or you can just start doing the right thing little by little. And and you know, I think that's what we have to think think like. You know, and you know, the fact that the government is talking about prevention, you know, the same sort of ridicule we experienced in organic, you know, we experienced in prevention in 1950. You know, where we were laughed at. You know, at that point, doctors were in cigarette ads. You know, so. Um, so I think, you know, crises are going to happen, but we should start acting as if they're not going to happen and, um, you know, do the best we can now. Thanks. You touched briefly on a cooperative venture that was sort of a Whole Foods model for farmers. I wanted to talk to you a little bit more about that I've been feeling the same thing, that there's a need yeah. for food distribution, better food distribution for organic farmers. How could I um, get some more of your thoughts about that and expand on that? Well, I mean, literally, it was just an idea I had, you know, last night. So that's, <laughs> you have the full thought. <laughs> but, you know, like, I don't know where, if you guys have out here um, Tractor Supply Company, you know, Small farmers go there, big, you know, it, it really, you have to like think of like an entrepreneur, like a business person. I'm going to start something and I'm going to like let it go big and, um, you know, um, so I would just study those models. Look at what whole, how Whole Foods did it, you know, start small, but, you know, have the courage to think big and not be afraid of thinking big. Yeah, there is, there is another group here that's sort of thinking, it's called the commons, and I'm seeing just the beginning stages of this thought process. Yeah. So, um, that's usually where I get started, is on the ground floor of everything. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Well, have fun. Good luck. Somebody will make a lot of money from it. <laughs> this Hi, is I'm the last question. Okay, thank you. <laughs> I'm a faculty member at a nearby university here in Cal State Monterey Bay. And one of the things that um, comes up for me in research studies, for instance, if uh, Monsanto came out with a research study on organic food, I would question it. Right. For obvious reasons. Mm -hmm. um, but do we get the opposite from, for instance, for the Organic Manifesto? Are they saying, well, of course you're going to support organic, and of course your yeah. results are going to demonstrate that. So is there a way to get a, an unbiased? Well, I, you know, I had that same concern when I was writing Organic Manifesto because, you know, I am also a journalist and, you know, aware of all, you know, the stuff that can go on. And um, so I actually did not um, footnote the Rodale Institute research at all in my book. Um, I found other groups that have done it independently. So, you know, John Teasdale at the USDA, um, he was my primary source for this information. Um, so, I, you know, I think that's a really good question. And, and um, you know, we try to be objective, um, but we definitely do come from um, a, a strong position. But if we saw something that, um, you know, let's just put it this way. If we saw something that showed chemical farming was a lot better, we wouldn't still be doing research. <laughs> we would have given up. Thank you. So thank you. Thank you all very much. It's been fun.
Hold on. We're not quite finished yet. We have one more juicy tidbit before you leave, so I hope you'll stay and join us. It's always, you know, in a gathering like this, I think it's always important to have some sort of closure. Not everybody makes it to the beach when we have our final closing ceremony, but just something to sort of wrap us all together um, to end this incredible conference where, where everybody, I think, felt so inspired. You know, we all come here, you know, with so tired and, and from our jobs and, and preparing for our talks or our exhibits or whatever everybody does to make this conference possible. And this is such a time of, of rejuvenation and, and just it's who's here, you know, obviously people leave, but we, it's just good to, to come together and, and just collect ourselves. So we have one more tidbit for you. And of course, in, in true uh, EcoFarm style, a few announcements. So, um, well, one of the other things I wanted to say is, if you really love it here, get involved. You know, really, it's important that we get your feedback, put your uh, comments, um, either do the written form here before you leave, or please do it online. The other thing is, is that we really do listen to what you say. A perfect example was last night, how we moved the banquet back into the dining hall by popular demand. We hear you. When you don't like something, we, we feel your pain. <laughs> we want you to come back. So we'll make those changes, you know, the best we can. So please be sure to, to give us your feedback online. Also, workshops. All workshops are evaluated. So be sure to get your workshop ideas together and put them online. We have an online form. Please be sure to do that. We really, that's why this conference, everybody says it's so awesome and it's so cutting edge. It's because of you. I mean, you come up with the idea, so please, please be sure to do that. Um, you know, we try to be, um, we want to recycle those, your badges, so just come up to the front at the end and just put the plastic up here on the front, on the floor. And no, 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 no. I think those are all my announcements. Now for our, just our, our closing, I'd like to welcome up to the stage Khalida Todd. She's our our woman of spirituality here at EcoFarm, and also uh, coming with her is Muriel Strand. Hi. So this is an opportunity to just really integrate what we've all experienced together in the last few days. Just to take a moment and really take it in deep and take it home. And uh, you know, we just, it was just mentioned, this possibility of total collapse and, and uh, paradigm shift. Yeah, we got to be thinking outside the box. And how was it, you know, back in the day when we, um, didn't really know, um, say, about uh, uh, agriculture. And we started with what had happened with agriculture before the chemicals were brought in. And then we combined the best of the new knowledge. And that's where we come from, right? It's this base that started back, way back, before they had these chemicals, and they figured out a form. So I invite us to think back to the indigenous cultures, the earth-based cultures that had something going in some form of sustainability before things got so out of whack. Um, the word human and humus derive from the same Latin humar. So we are from the soil. You know, we are an earth-based culture, and especially us here who are the land lovers and the land um, stewards. So even though we don't live in one community and we're not one big village, we are an extended village of like-minded people that are earth-based and are thinking in terms of that. Um, we have a really, of course, this amazing, I've always been amazed by the miracle of water, the miracle of the cycle of water, and you know how it rains and then goes up and comes back and goes into the rivers and the lakes first and the mountains, the rivers, the ocean. Wow, 
You know, who created that? Who created this? Who created this human form that knows how to breathe and, and you know, release and take in and be able to sustain? So we have a lot of thinking outside the box to do. And I do hope we will invite ourselves to really open our minds and explore um, all potential and all possibility. We are in chaos. Chaos can go anywhere, you know? So let's never give up hope. One of the things we have to do is stay entrained. You know, I, yeah, I find it devastating that the earth might be forgetting about us or needing to just slap us upside the head and tell us, you know, <laughs> that we've got to start paying much better attention and is going to tell us in a hard way. But that doesn't mean I, I need to give up and go crawl into a, a ball somewhere. I've got to find a new way to um, think about this and honor. And so I'm inviting us to do that. Of course, our water, you know, it's our generational heritage that we're talking about this weekend as one of our main themes and isn't keeping the water uh, pure and clean and coming back to us so much, so much a part of offering to the next generations. So one thing I want to tell you about that has been very much one of my teachings is um, I was told about um, an experience a shamanic friend of mine had and he wound up on the top of a pyramid in Mexico and he, in his meditation, he saw this black jaguar come to him and say, get on my back and I'll take you on a journey. And so he, in you know, his meditation, got on this jaguar's back and it took off and it burst from this world into the next and then it burst from that world into the next and then it burst from that world into the next and he found himself in this whole new place at the feet of an ancient rain god named Teotec. And there's other, there's Talok, and there's many other ways to say that name as well as rain gods and goddesses from the beginning of time. If you happen to have a culture that you're particularly affiliated with, you might check in. So what did he say to Teotec? Teotec, he said, you know, he said, well, you know, we're having drought in California. This was about, I don't know, 12 years ago. And um, we're having drought in Mexico. Why won't you come? We need you. And Teotec said, why should I come? What do you call me? You call me bad weather. You call me crummy, crappy, funky weather, you know? What do I hear? Oh, I wanted to have a barbecue, but the, the weather got bad, you know? So let's get, let's get conscious of our words. Let's get conscious of what we call this blessed gift. And when we do ask for it, we need to ask for gentle, penetrating rains. <laughs> Okay, so I'm just going to invite us to take a nice deep breath all together. And exhale. Oh. Now, as we breathe together, we entrain. Okay, as a human species that has mind, heart, breath, we have the ability as we entrain to bring our thoughts our minds, our hearts, and our intentions together into one place. So I'm just going to invite us to take four deep breaths slowly. I'll kind of give the guidance on it. And um, really take in what we have received. Because when you take it in, you have it to give back. So we don't have any excuses to not to block stuff. If somebody tells you, you are a good farmer, take that in because then you will have something more to offer to someone down the road. So the first breath, big breath, and we take in air, and it brings in the is wisdom and the inspiration of all that we have experienced together, and express gratitude with your out breath. The second breath, breathe in to your bones, the, uh, the earth, this is the earth of your body. Take that wisdom and inspiration into your bones 
So you're holding it where you need it and express gratitude in your out breath. Now breathe into your blood and feel it go through your streams and canals of your body, the water of your body. And now breathe into your heart, the passion and the fire, the creativity that we need to figure this out and express gratitude for what you know. So from Eco Farm and from all of us, we ask you to have safe journeys wherever you're going. Return to us with even more inspiration and exchange. And please come out to the beach, because we're going to do a little more of this. We're going to do this in training of mind, heart, and focus. And we're going to honor the water. And if you have any water songs, if you have any songs of gratitude, especially ones you can teach us and we can share together, if you have musical instruments, bring them on. And we're going to have Muriel come out. And I'm sorry, she got invited up here, but she's going to come out there with her rain stick and help us invoke the uh, directions and honor the water. So, and this is Muriel right here. Thank you. So it's right after lunch, 1.30 on the beach. Make sure you're out of your room. Lots of love. <laughs>